tonight, and I hear it's well to do this college all the school in advance, this is the actual law. Um, a very warm welcome to this lecture this evening at the University College of Edinburgh. Um, many of you, if not all of you, would be familiar with our speaker this evening. Um, His Honour William Cain is former Attorney General and former First Deemster, and many of you will also know him through his work for the Wildlife Trust, for which he was awarded the Vine of Bananen Award by Culture Vanden in 2015. He is <laughs> um, also, as it happens, unsurprisingly, an expert in the political and constitutional history of the Isle of Man. And so I'm absolutely delighted that he's agreed to come and speak with us this evening about the Man's Constitution and whether or not it constitutes a constitutional anomaly. Thank you very much. Well, ladies and gentlemen, um, thank you for coming to this lecture. Uh, the um, Manx Constitution, which is the subject of this lecture, was referred to by the late Enoch Powell in the House of Commons in December 1982 as, I quote, a constitutional anomaly of historic proportions, which can be tolerated provided it is not a nuisance. <laughs> Enoch Powell was not alone in describing the Isle of Man as an anomaly. Even the sympathetic Royal Commission on the Constitution in 1973 said that the island system of government was full of anomalies which are more logical and orderly race than the British would have swept away long ago and incorporated Island into the United Kingdom. An anomaly is defined in the Oxford English Dictionary as an irregularity or deviation from the common or natural order. Why, I ask, is it part of the natural order for the island to be part of the UK? I hope to demonstrate that the modern constitution of the Isle of Man is neither an anomaly to be tolerated, nor a deviation from the natural order, but the product of many centuries of rational decisions by the island's rulers, taking into account the island's geography, history and law. The Constitution is not, of course, a single formal document, as is the Constitution of most countries but can be found in legal decisions, particularly of the Privy Council, in Acts of Parliament and of Timwald, and in the reports of various committees and commissions, and in constitutional practice. In one respect, Enoch Powell was right. It is of historic proportions. I will first look at the status of the island as a separate jurisdiction, that is, a territory with its own laws and legal system, originally a kingdom, then a feudal lordship, and today a crown dependency. And then we consider the origin and development of Timon. For those of you who are not familiar with Manx history, I have prepared a timeline into which the island's history may be divided. The Viking Kingdom, which lasted about 350 years, the period of Scottish rule, about 60 years, the period of rule by English lords, about 60 years, and then the rule by the Stanleys and their Athel cousins as vassals of the English crown <coughs> for about 350 years. And finally, the modern period since their investment of the crown, about 250 years. The starting point, inevitably, must be the Viking settlement of the island around the year 900 AD. 
Thereafter, man, together with the Hebrides, emerged as a kingdom ruled by kings of Norse descent, who, at least nominally, owed allegiance to the kings of Norway. The kingdom of man and the isles came to an end when Norse power over the islands to the west of Scotland collapsed, following the inconclusive Battle of Largs and the subsequent sale of man and the isles by Norway to Scotland by the Treaty of Perth of 1266. <coughs> the account of that treaty in the Melrose Chronicle stated that man was, I quote, formally called a kingdom. <coughs> the treaty itself provided that the inhabitants of the islands, I quote, shall be subject to the laws and customs of Scotland. It is clear that the Scottish king, Alexander III, intended that man should become part of the kingdom of Scotland. And although in the Anglo-Scottish wars which followed his death, man repeatedly changed hands between England and Scotland, it did end up in 1317 under Scottish rule. However, about seven years later, in 1324, the status of man changed when it was granted by the Scottish king, Robert I, to the Earl of Murray, by a charter which elevated man to a regality or sub-kingdom, reflecting its former status. Scottish policy for the Isle of Man was now, as Colin McNamee put it in the new history of the Isle of Man, I quote, complete autonomy yet inseparably linked to Scotland through the personal loyalty of the Lord." End of quote. From a Scottish point of view, this would have been the proper destiny of man. But only nine years later, in 1333, the young English king, Edward III, retook the island and then renounced <coughs> his claim to man in favour of his friend, William Montacute, who claimed to be king or lord of land by descent from the Norse kings. Thus, strangely enough, both Scotland and England had recognised the separate and distinct status of man. We now move on to the decisive events of 1399 made familiar to us by William Shakespeare, when Henry of Lancaster usurped the English throne, becoming Henry IV and forcing, and forcing Richard II to abdicate. William Scroop, then the Lord of Man, having purchased the island from the son of William Montacute, and the principal minister of Richard II was in Bristol, when he was seized and summarily executed by Henry's men. This was treated by Henry and indeed confirmed by the English Parliament as the conquest of man. Whether there was a real conquest has long been a matter of dispute. However, Professor Peter Edge, writing in 1997, commented, I quote, the mere decree of the Crown and Parliament that a given territory has been taken by conquest does not make that a historical fact. Nonetheless, it appears to be an accurate description of the process by which an absolute ruler of a territory was taken and executed, his territory falling to the person who ordered his death. I agree. In any event, Henry then granted the conquered island to the Earl of Northumberland with a reservation of service, namely that of carrying the Lancaster sword at the coronation of each English monarch. In feudal law, a reservation of service was a formal acknowledgement by a vassal tenant that he held land of a superior lord kind of peppercorn rent. 
The Northumberland Lordship, however, did not last long. The Earl was involved in the rebellion and his lands were confiscated by Henry IV, who then ordered John Stanley <coughs> and his brother to seize the island. In October 1405, Stanley was granted the island for life. Then, on the 6th of April 1406, probably one of the best known dates in Manx history, Henry IV granted the island and lordship of man to John Stanley and his heirs in perpetuity. The grant was subject to a reservation of service, I quote, for the homage, allegiance and service of rendering to us two falcons and rendering to our heirs, future kings of England, two falcons on their coronation days. <coughs> the constitutional significance of which we have seen. Unlike William Scroop and his predecessors, who had been nominally independent rulers of the island, Stanley <coughs> and his heirs became vassals of the English crown, holding, holding the island in the feudal sense as tenants of a superior lord. What then was the effect of these events on the constitution? Firstly, the island had become a <coughs> possession of the English crown, although not part of England itself, and remains so to the present day. Moreover, as man was a conquered territory, the English crown could intervene in Manx affairs and replace the existing law and constitution, if necessary, by an act of parliament or through the Privy Council. Secondly, the island retained its separate and distinct status, not as a kingdom, although the title of king continued to be used in the island, but as a vassal lordship of the English crown, a status it would retain for the next 350 years. Thirdly, as Henry IV made no change to the Conquered Islands law or constitution as he could have done, the Stanleys, as vassal lords, were obliged to rule the island in accordance with its existing customary law and institutions. The customary law was then unwritten and could only be determined by the Deemsters. It was known as Brest Law as it was locked away in the breasts of the Deemsters. This created a problem for the Stanleys, as we shall see. Just over 100 years later, the status of land <coughs> was to be considered by the Privy Council. Thomas Stanley, the second Earl of Derby and Lord of Man, had died in 1521, leaving his son Edward, a minor, as his successor. This gave rise to a claim for a dower by Thomas Stanley's widow. The claim failed because the court held, I quote, the Isle of Man is not parcel of the realm and they do not use the law of the land. It is like Tournay when it was in the king's hands and Normandy or Gascony which are absolutely outside the power of the chancery. And that is the place, and no other, for endowing the widow of the king's tenant. The Isle of Wight, however, is made part of the county of Southampton by statute, and Wales and Ireland are part of the realm. A writ of error lies in England for an erroneous judgment given in Ireland or Wales, but not for such erroneous judgment given in the Isle of Man Gascony or Calais, for they are not part of the realm and do not use the laws of the realm. <coughs> the importance of this case, the first incidentally to be reported in the new series of the Manx Law Reports, is obvious. We have a clear statement from the highest authority about the island's constitutional status for the first time since its conquest by Henry IV. Put simply, although man was a possession of the English crown, it was not part of England and was not governed by English law 
or the English courts that had a status comparable to the overseas territories of the English crown in France. In 1594, another succession issue arose when Ferdinand Stanley, the fifth Lord of Derby and Lord of Man, died leaving three young daughters but no son. It was not clear who should succeed to the Lordship of Man. The matter was referred by Queen Elizabeth to the Privy Council in what became known as the Isle of Man case. In 1598, the Privy Council ruled, amongst other things, that <coughs> Acts of Parliament were not binding on the Isle of Man, I quote, without special and express provision for it, end of quote. It followed, therefore, that Parliament did have power to bind the Isle of Man if special and express provision was made for it. Subsequently, an agreement was reached amongst the Stanley family as to who should succeed to the Lordship of Man, and in 1609 a fresh draft of the island was made by the new king, James I, to the sixth Earl of Derby and his wife. In the following year, 1610, this was confirmed by an Act of Parliament. In 1663, another case from the Isle of Man came before the Privy Council. In 1660, Parliament had passed an Act pardoning those <coughs> other than the regicides who had taken part in the rebellion against Charles I. The Act provided, I quote, that all and every the subjects of these His Majesty's realms of England and Ireland, the Dominion of Wales, the Isles of Jersey and Guernsey, and the town of Berwick upon Tweed, and other His Majesty's dominions, end of quote, shall be pardoned. The Isle of Man was not named specifically. Notwithstanding, the Act of Pardon, however, Charles VIII, Earl of Derby, was determined to prosecute William Christian, popularly known as William Doan, for his alleged disloyalty to his, the Earl's mother, the Countess Charlotte. As we all know, Christian was tried, condemned to death, and executed by shooting on the 2nd of January, 1663 another iconic date in the Manx calendar. Christian's son appealed to the Privy Council, but unfortunately the petition was not received until after Christian's death. In July, the petition was considered by the Privy Council, which gave its judgment on the 5th of August, 1663, I quote. After a full hearing of the whole matter on both sides, the said judges did declare that the Act of General Pardon and Indemnity did and ought to be understood to extend to the Isle of Man as well as into any other of His Majesty's dominions and plantations beyond the seas. And that being a public general act of Parliament, it ought to have been taken notice of by the judges in the Isle of Man. Although it had not been pleaded, and although there was no proclamation made thereof. The Privy Council roundly condemned the illegal execution of Christian and ordered, amongst other things, that the two deemsters who decreed, I quote, this violent death, should remain prisoners in the King's bench and be prosecuted for, I quote, so heinous a fact. The Deemsters were in fact released in the following year. I consider that the man who should have been punished was the 8th Earl of Derby rather than my unfortunate predecessors. <laughs> From the judgments of the Privy Council in the Isle of Man case and the William Christian case, and also in 19, the 1610 Act of Parliament, it was clear beyond doubt that Parliament had power to legislate for the Isle of Man and that it was not necessary to mention the Isle of Man specifically if it was clear on the face of the Act 
that it was intended that it should extend to the island. Nearly 90 years later, in 1751, in a very lengthy case in the English Chancery Court involving the Bishop of Soda and Man, the Earl of Derby, the Duke of Athol, Lord Hardwick, the Lord Chancellor, usefully summarised the island's constitutional status, I quote. Many things are admitted on both sides that man is not part of the realm of England, parcel only of the Queen, King's Crown of England, a distinct dominion now under the King's grants, and so ever since from a long time past granted, held as a feudatory dominion by liege homage of the Kings of England. The laws of England therefore, as such, extend not to it, neither the common nor statute law, unless expressly named or some necessary consequence resulting from it. Essentially, the island status had not changed since Henry IV's conquest in 1399, but change was coming. In 1765, the Duke and Duchess, the third Duke and Duchess of Athol, sold and surrendered to the Crown for £70,000 their rights as vassal lords of man, save for their manorial and ecclesiastical rights. The surrender was confirmed by the Revestment Act 1765 of Parliament. The revestment may be seen as an important step towards modernity although it was not seen like that at the time. The Crown now became directly responsible for the island's government. The governor, previously appointed by and responsible to the Duke of Athol, now became an officer of the Crown, as did the other government officers. The governor would now take his orders from London, and in particular from the Secretary of State who advised the Crown. <coughs> the investment also had a profound effect on the legislative, legislative function of the Crown. <coughs> Although, as we have seen, some other Acts of Parliament, some Acts of Parliament passed before the investment had applied to the island, after 1765 it was Parliament which legislated for Manx customs and excise, then the principal form of taxation. Previously, customs and excise had been a matter for Timwood, and was only restored to Timwood in 1958. During the 19th century, many Acts of Parliament on various other matters were extended to the island, including some which applied throughout the British Empire, like the Merchant Shipping Acts. However, in the 20th century, the Royal Commission on the Constitution, reporting in 1973 on the relationship between Parliament and the Isle of Man and the Channel Islands, commented, I quote, All our official witnesses accepted that Parliament has power to legislate for the islands, and that in some respect, at least, the exercise of this power is not dependent upon the islands' consent being given. It has, however, been the practice not to legislate for the islands without their consent on matters which are of purely domestic concern to them. There has been strict adherence to the practice over a very long period, and it is in this sense that it can be said that a constitutional convention has been established whereby Parliament does not legislate for the islands without their consent on domestic matters. <coughs> the Royal Commission went on to consider the exceptional circumstances when it would be proper for Parliament to legislate for the island without the consent of Timor. I do not see any anomaly in the relationship between Parliament and the Isle of Man. What then of the island's internal constitution of which the most important institution is, of course, Tinwald. In answer to Enoch Powell's hostile remarks in December 1982, the Home Office Minister, David Miller, commented, I quote, 
For over 1,000 years, Manx law has been made by the island's parliament, the Timwood, which is probably the oldest continuing legislature in the world. The legitimacy and validity of acts of the Timwood are not based on any grant of confidence from the United Kingdom Parliament. Parliament has always recognised their existence and validity. <coughs> the origin of Timwood is unknown, but in the view of Sir David Wilson, I quote, it clearly has a roots in the Scandinavian period. He continued, the idea of an assembly under the name, a name similar to Timwood is familiar in Scandinavia, and there seems to be no reason why the name should not have been introduced into the island in the Viking Age. It presumably originally functioned, as did its Icelandic counterpart, counterpart Thingvar, as a meeting to resolve disputes, to promulgate and execute laws, and to debate matters which would affect the whole community. Although there are earlier documentary references to Timwald, the first, the, the earliest surviving record is of a meeting of Timwald in 1417. On the orders of the younger John Stanley, who had succeeded his father as Lord of Man in 1414, a new book was opened in which to recall the laws which had been, I quote, ratified, approved, and confirmed. The first entry was the well known statement about the procedure to be followed at the annual meeting of Timwood on Timwood Hill which has been faithfully followed to this day. But Timwood was then a general assembly of the whole island. In the 1417 book, it was said that laws had to be approved by the law and by all, I quote, barons, deemsters, officers, tenants, inhabitants, and commons, end of quote. But the most important participants when Timwood emerged from the shadows of its undocumented past were the Lord of Man or his representative, the council comprising the barons and the Lord's principal officers, the two deemsters and the twenty-four keys. The deemsters were the judges and the guardians of the customary law, while the keys were advisers to the deemsters. Keys were not originally a representative body. They were known as the worthiest men. They were appointed by the Lord and also had judicial functions, sitting as an appeal court. Timwald and many of its officers had legislative, judicial and executive functions. There was then no concept of the separation of powers. Timwald usually met twice a year but only occasionally were new laws promulgated. They generally took the form of a declaration of customary law by the Deemsters. The most important declaration of law in the 15th century, now known as the Customary Laws 1422, was drawn up by the Deemsters and Keys at the request of the younger John Stanley. The declaration contained 99 paragraphs of which six remain in force. Declarations of custom law continue to be made and breast law continue to be relied on by the Deemsters at least as late as the 17th century. In 1636, the Lord was informed that, I quote, the deemsters of the island do sometimes give judgment by laws unknown to his lordship or any other of his council of that island called breast laws. End of quote. The deemsters were ordered, I quote, to set down in writing and certify to his honour by the next passage after which laws these breast laws are and of what use and in what cases they are requisite, and how far their power and execution of them extend. It appears
convinced that the Deemsters quite rightly ignored the Lord's order. <laughs> the first written account of the Mayor's customary law was made by Deemster Parr in about 1690. I sometimes wonder whether later generations of Deemsters may occasionally have given judgment, judgments by laws unknown to his lordship, or indeed anyone else. Perhaps there are still laws in the breasts of the Deemsters waiting to be revealed. <laughs> in the 17th century, the rule of the keys began to change. The record of Timwood in June 1645 and again in 1661 described the keys as the representative body of the country. Thereafter, the keys were usually described as the representative body in the preambles to Acts of Timwood. The keys were no longer merely the deepest advisors on the customary law, but had the representatives of the Manx people in the legislature. There were other changes. From the middle of the 16th, 17th century, the keys appointed their own chairman, later speaker. And when there was a vacancy in the keys, they put forward two names to the governor, who then chose one of them. Usually the governor, council, deemsters and keys met at Castle Russian or St John's as one body. However, after 1704, the keys normally sat separately in their own chamber when considering bills, which could be introduced into either the council or the keys. When a bill had been approved, the keys were summoned to the council chamber in the castle to sign the bill, which was then sent to the Lord for his assent. If there was a disagreement between the council and the keys, they met together to resolve the issue. Timwold had been transformed from a medieval assembly to a modern bicameral legislature. But unusually, the two branches, the Council and Cadiz Keys, continue to sit together as the Timul Court for other business, as they do today. In 1792, the commissions of inquiry into the complaints of the fourth Duke of Athol commented, and I quote, the laws and ordinances that were enacted in the island during the 15th and 16th centuries appear by the Manx Statute Book to have been prescribed by such different parts <coughs> or combination of power that as precedents of the exercise of legislative authority they can have but little of weight. Subsequent to this period was established a more regular mode of legislation which subsisted at the time of the investment. And from the beginning of the last century, the legislative authority of the country has been vested in the Lord Proprietor, the Governor and Council, and the 24 Keys. When these three estates, or the two latter of them, were assembled, they were called the Timber Court. And by the joint concurrence, of these three branches of the legislative part of the island, the laws which governed its inhabitants were enacted. We have there the constitutional position of Timwald at the revestment. So what changed in 1765? It appears that Timwald as a legislature might well have fallen into oblivion. In a letter to the Duke of Athol in August 1776, that's 11 years after their investment, Bishop Richmond commented that since 1765, <coughs> I quote, the people here had been utterly at a loss to know how and by whom laws might be enacted, continued, altered, or repealed. End of quote. The question was whether in future laws were to be enacted by Timor or by Parliament. Although the Crown had taken over many of the functions of the old laws, there was no reason why Parliament could not have provided 
whatever new laws the island required for its good government, as it did for customs and excise matters. Timwood as a legislature might well have been regarded as redundant, surviving only as a quaint annual ceremony on Timwood Hill. The last act to be passed before the revestment, which dealt with drainage and other matters, was assented to by the Duke of Athol on the 28th of May 1763 and was promulgated upon Timwood Hill on the 5th of July 1763. The statute book is then silent until it recalls that the Timwood met at Castle Rushton on the 18th of May 1776 to discuss a bill dealing with highway improvements and other matters. The preamble to the bill stated that, I quote, His Majesty has been most graciously pleased to grant his royal leave and permission for the reenacting of certain temporary acts of Timon, heretofore made by the Lord Proprietor, the Governor, Council and Peace, for the interior government and police of the said Isle. The bill was duly passed by the Council of Keys and subsequently received royal assent from the Crown. The Act was promulgated upon Timwood Hill on the 5th of July 1776. The Act established a constitutional precedent of fundamental importance. The Crown had not merely recognised Timwood as the island's historic legislature, but by assenting to the, to the Act, the Crown had in effect confirmed the Isle of Man as a continuing separate jurisdiction. Why did the Crown grant royal assent to the Act of 1776? No doubt there were many considerations. As visitors to Colonial Williamsburg may have noticed, Timwood had a striking resemblance to the legislature of Virginia. Officials in Whitehall would have recognised the similarity of Timur to the colonial legislatures with which they were familiar. I also believe that events across the Atlantic in 1775 did have some bearing on the momentous decision to allow Timur to continue as the, as the island's legislature. The Journal of the House of Keys records that on the 23rd of October 1775, the keys, no doubt prompted by the Lieutenant Governor Richard Dawson, sent an address to the King expressing their abhorrence of the rebellion in the American colonies and pledging in fulsome terms their loyalty to the Crown. On the following day, 24th of October 1775, the keys describing themselves as the representative of the inhabitants of the Isle of Man, sent him a memorial to the king, setting out many matters which required attention, including the reenactment of certain acts of Timwood, and quote, made for the good government and internal police of this island, which were about to expire, and which could not be revived, I quote, without your majesty's royal assent. The long address to the, of the keys to the king and their memorial were promptly dispatched by the Lieutenant Governor to the Secretary of State, who replied on the 16th of November 1775, saying, I quote, he had laid the address of the House of Keys of the Isle of Man before the king. He continued, it is with great pleasure that I acquaint you, His Majesty was pleased to receive very graciously the expression of duty, loyalty, and affection of his subjects in that island. On receipt of this letter, the Lieutenant Governor called a special meeting of the Kings for the 5th of December 1775. Commenting, I quote, so your most loyal and affectionate address on this critical occasion will undoubtedly endear you to His Majesty 
and ensure to you his royal favour and attention. The keys would not be disappointed. In the following year, the king indicated that Timur could proceed with a bill, and on the 10th of May 1776, the keys met and appointed a committee, William Quayle, William Callow, and Thomas Farmer, to draw up a bill with, I quote, the utmost diligence and expedition. The committee must have worked night, day and night as a bill containing 23 clauses was drafted within a week, approved by Timwood on the 18th of May, sent to the Secretary of State for Royal Assent on the 22nd of May, being returned with the approbation of the King on the 7th of June, in time to be promulgated on Timwood Hill on the 5th of July, 1776. As it happened, the day after the American Declaration of Independence was approved by Congress. I'm sure there's a lesson there for modern ranks and legislators that when it's needed, time is of the essence, anything can be achieved. In the following year, 1777, Timur passed a major act containing 15, containing 15 chapters. The modern era was on its way. The House of Keats became an elected body 90 years later, in 1866, on a limited franchise subsequently extended by state <coughs> to a universal franchise. The Legislative Council was reformed after the First World War following the report of the Macdonald Committee in 1911. The role and membership of the Council is still being debated. Since 1981, royal assent to bills passed by Timur has normally been granted by the left handed Governor on behalf of the Crown, but only when authorised to do so by the Secretary of State. There is nothing anomalous about Timwood as a modern legislature. An important part of any constitution is the judicature. Traditionally, the senior judges were the two ministers who had an important role in Timwood. The second minister, however, ceased to be a member of the Legislative Council and Timwood in 1965 followed by the first minister in 1975. The Keys had lost their judicial role when they became an elected body. The Lieutenant Governor ceased to have judicial functions in 1918, when a new office, that of Judge of Appeal, was created. The final appeal court remains the Privy Council in London. To cope with a greatly increased workload in recent years, additional deepsters have been appointed. The modern judiciary is totally independent of government. No anomaly there. Finally, we turn to the executive government, the part of the Manx Constitution which has undergone a revolution over the past <coughs> last 60 years. During the period of the Norse Kingdom, the ruler would, of course, be the king himself. But during the period of Scottish rule and thereafter, the king, or lord, as he became known, would not normally have resided on the island and may never even have visited the island. So the government would in practice have been largely in the hands of the governor and the lord's officers. This did not change at the revestment, although as we have seen, the governor and his the officers then became officers of the Crown, and the officials in the Home Office may have taken more or at times less interest in the day-to-day -day government of the island than the old Lords. Writing in 1893 in the Land of Home Rule, Spencer Walpole, who had been Lieutenant Governor from 1882 to 1893, described the Governor's role, I quote, as the representative of the sovereign, 
he has succeeded to many of the functions and privileges of the Earl of Lords. And the circumstances of the island, which is too small for the formation of a regular ministry, has confirmed him in the possession of these powers and has invested in him the sole executive authority. Thus, in addition to his legislative duties as president of the Timur Court and of the council, he discharges many of the duties which in other countries are performed by responsible ministers. He is his own finance minister, his own home secretary, his president of the local government board. If taxes are imposed, they are imposed at his suggestion. If expenditure is brought forward, it is proposed on his authority. He continued, thus, in the legislature, in the judicature, and in the executive, power is largely concentrated in the governor. <coughs> One consequence of the role of the governor was that when Timbal decided to take on a new function, for example, a, uh, establishing a lunatic asylum, the statutory board had to be created with power to raise its revenue by rate. By 1900, there were about 10 of these bodies. By 1980, there were over 20. They were called boards of Timur. Before 1962, each board even employed its own staff. The civil servants served the governor. Each board was largely autonomous. In 1957, the United Kingdom agreed to relinquish ultimate control over the island's finances, an unlikely decision if Timur was then an anomaly. In 1958, a commission was appointed under the chairmanship of Lord McDermott to advise on the Island Money Constitution, which reported in 1959. Their proposals led to the establishment of a new executive Council and a finance board, which eventually took over the financial responsibilities of the governor and the transfer of nearly all of the governor's executive functions to other bodies. In the early 1980s, it was decided to replace the boards of Timur with a ministerial system for which Spencer Walpole, a century before, had considered the island was too small. The first Chief Minister, Sir Miles Walker, was appointed at the end of 1986. During the last 30 years, there have been many changes to the new system, and Lord Lisvane has proposed further reforms, which are to be the subject of the next lecture, lecture here <coughs> in the new year. In my view, the present system is a vast improvement on, on what went on before. As a matter of stand, I see no anomaly with the executive government. In my view, the surprising feature of the Manx Constitution is that it was only in 1986 that the Iron Man achieved an executive government fully responsible to Timor. In the timeline of Manx history, I consider that a new sixth era then began. Moreover, the island's government is now part of a new emerging natural order in the governments of the British Isles, based on several historic nations and regions. Irish independence and devolution in the last 20 years has seen to that. The Manx Constitution is not an anomaly and never was.